So going back to some of these other types of tools, the number one thing I would tell people right now is understand what your potential equity position is on your property. Maybe have a, a, some form of a desk review done by a local agent or broker. Uh, most agents in the area would be happy to do that if they thought they might be able to earn your business. And just know exactly what your, I mean, if nothing else, a Zestimate through, through Zillow would be a, an adequate starting point. Understand what the difference between that Zestimate or desk review value of your appraisal of your of your property is compared to what you currently owe i, I would start by looking at what a an 80 percent maximum combined loan to value meaning if you were to take a property value of say five hundred thousand dollars and multiply that through a calculation of 0.8 you'd be looking at a four hundred thousand dollar maximum loan amount that's combined loans between the first and the new home equity line of credit if you currently owe say three hundred thousand dollars on the property that would mean that you would have eligibility of $100,000 to 80% combined loan to value. Very important to know that some lenders up until recently were happy to still go to 90%, maybe even higher in some rare cases. That's combined loan to value. But that's really where you're gonna run the higher risk of those types of loans being closed first or frozen when the crash begins to take place. You will start to see banks protecting themselves as that value of your collateral dips. They will no longer give you access. So if you haven't borrowed from it and you were hoping it was just going to be sitting there available to you for use at any time, you may, be, uh, you may wake up one day and be disappointed about that. Yeah. And I'm seeing that every day just out there on the streets right now, whether it's institutional or private or hard. I mean, they LTVs are adjusting. I mean, literally in real time every single day. So I'm seeing an ebb and flow with that. Obviously, people need to be cognizant of that. So you're saying basically the first step. And it's amazing to me, um, and I'm not saying that as a, a negative or a positive, but people that I talk to that um, do you know, make financially sound decisions, they are homeowners. They have a nice equity position. They have on-time payments. They've got good credit. They have no idea what a HELOC is and certainly would not have any idea, you know, what, you know, the BLOCs are and some of the other unsecured lines that you discussed there. Let's just for two seconds here, let's go HELOC 101. So you're recognizing first and foremost, you need to figure out what your equity position is. What would be the next two or three basic steps for someone? And I just walked through this exercise with, um, you know, someone very close to me in my life, and they've got had several hundred thousand dollars of equity, had no idea how to access it. The uh, the refi was off the table for the reasons we stated earlier in this video. What do you say to that to that individual? First of all, you just have to determine exactly what dollar amount is going to serve your purposes the most. It seems that most lenders are going to still kind of keep their cap at near that $250,000 point. And, and often you'll find the availability of higher loan amounts there, but it requires a lot more scrutinization. The underwriting process can be a lot more miserable. The $250,000 of home equity lines uh, of a home equity line that I got most recently was actually really easy. I got it through Ent Credit Union, ENT, and I know their footprint is rather small, but it really closed in 10 days and it didn't require any income verification whatsoever. They did it purely on a desk review. Of course, my combined loan to value on that property, even with the $250,000 that was approved, came in at somewhere around 50%. So really low risk to them, perfect credit. Sure. Overall eligibility was as good as it gets as far as borrowing strength. So. I, I don't want you to expect that. In fact, I generally recommend people go into these types of applications expecting the worst and even possibly a declination. About one third of the time, I'm still declined. Even as the perfect borrower, I might look like on paper, sometimes the banks just don't have that money to lend. And it doesn't mean they're gonna strip the website down and say, or post something on it that says, sorry, we're no longer accepting applications. <laughs> and it, it, you know, th therefore, the possibility of you getting declined on a debt weapon certainly exists. What we generally find is it goes from about a 50-50 coin flip to about a two-thirds of the time approval success rate based on using the debt weapon cheat sheet that I'd like to give away to the audience here today. But as far as home equity lines of credit, it's a collateralized, secured line of credit that revolves. It operates same as cash, which means that I could literally go into my bank right now and take the availability of that home equity line of credit, whatever's not used, and immediately deposit or transfer it into my checking account, and it would be ready to use today. There's not even a delay about it. The better part of home equity lines of credit that make them uniquely special 
is that they're considered eligible forms of down payment, which means that when you're ready to pull the trigger on a real estate purchase, you don't have to season that money in your bank for 60 days, which is the typical requirement for any other source of money. If you were to put money into that account, it would have to be in there for at least 60 days before the new lender for that new purchase would be uh, willing to accept that as a form of down payment. So home equity lines of credit have always been very special in this way. I also find that the utilization of home equity lines of credit don't have the same dramatic impact on credit scores that other unsecured revolving types of credit do like credit cards. If you were to use 50% of your credit card availability, you're gonna see your credit scores a lot more negatively impacted than using 50% of your home equity line of credit. I have made videos in the past showing that it still does have a fairly significant impact. I think my scores after using a home equity line of credit in advance of that video dropped by something like 30 or 40 points. That's totally normal. And this is why we want credit scores to be at that 760 and above level so that you can absorb the natural volatility that's gonna happen based on the use of your credit. Credit is designed to be used. It's, if, you're, if you're using your credit as a tool, it can make you an unbelievable amount of money. Mine has. Mine has literally made me millions of dollars over the course of many years. However, you just have to be sensitive to the fact that using credit creates peaks and valleys uh, based on score fluctuation. So 760 and above is the target that we always recommend people shoot for. 740 and up is generally going to get you the best rate and terms for that given product or that bank's collection of products. That's usually considered the best for the banks is 740 and up. So we always build that 20 point buffer in there just to kind of create some padding for that fluctuation. So going back to the home equity line of credit, it's a phenomenal tool. And it is something that um, you have to be careful using. You can't go out there and use it in any type of uh, reckless way, uh, in any type of risky way. You're really gonna have to weigh your risk tolerance because you are securing it against the value of your home. And if you do not repay that home equity line of credit, you will not have a home anymore. They'll, they'll foreclose on you. So a couple quick questions on that HELOC, uh, and thanks for that. But if people are looking at it right now, and we're talking about things being timely and there being some expediency and things right now just based on market volatility, if people are looking at they're seeing interest rates continue to go up, which obviously your HELOC is going to be tied to um, prime rate plus, right? So would there be a recommendation if they are looking at the HELOC to do that? sooner than later we just had a 75 basis point uh rate hike which they're not necessarily completely tied to mortgage rates but there is some direct correlation there sooner than later uh, make a move on the HELOC obviously with continued uh hikes in the interest rates i don't think it's really as interest rate driven the interest rate on a home equity line of credit is going to be what it is in most cases you'll find certain lenders that uh, will give you the option of, of actually locking in a fixed portion of your balance. So if you utilize something within a specific timeline, oftentimes that lender might say you can lock in that portion as a fixed rate. But it's not this indefinite opportunity where they say if you use it at any point in time, you can lock it in at, say, 7% interest. It's attached to prime, like you said, it's prime plus a margin. So depending on whatever your loan approval comes back in, you'll have some flexibility as far as accepting a slightly higher margin in order to maybe avoid some of the closing costs that would be involved. Typically closing costs on home equity lines of credit are very affordable. I mean, you can typically see a home equity line of credit getting approved with less than $1,000. You compare that to a cash out refinance, like you mentioned before, you're gonna oftentimes see a two to 3% closing cost uh, difference and that can end up becoming, you know, depending on the size of your home, do the math, right? If it's just two percent optimistically on a five hundred thousand dollar loan, you're looking at ten grand in closing costs versus a thousand for a HELOC. Huge difference. So even though you may not see the interest rate advantages by going in and doing a cash out where you can fix the rate, which again, as you'd mentioned, isn't going to be, be appealing to as nearly as many people as it was just a few short months ago you know, how long would it take for that difference in costs to close to be made up, especially if you're doing a cash out refinance with no real intention of where that money is going to go yet. If you're just going to cash out and throw $250,000 into your bank account and just wait, you're paying interest on that immediately 
instead of only using it when you need it. So it's less of an interest rate concern for me as it is what is the money going to be used for in order to drive that cash flow position up. I can't help but remind the audience of my recent success story using my home equity line of credit where $50,000 was borrowed in order to fund a, a drain business in Colorado. That drain business has done very well the first year. We just, uh, just circled our first year anniversary in February and we're obviously well underway into our second year, which we're seeing extraordinary growth already. But that first year we hit about $140,000 worth of profit. That was split between just myself and one other person. About $70,000 came my way. Guess what? That's on a $50,000 loan. That's a tremendous ROI. I'll do that all day long. And if we can hit 350 or even 500,000 this year, which is our prediction. We're, we're projecting now that we can exceed a half a million dollars. We're adding to our fleet, new vehicles, new equipment. Um, you know, those are loans worth taking. I would do that all day. I don't care if the interest rate on that, technically speaking, uh, the interest rate could have been 20% and it wouldn't be an issue, right? Uh, on that 50, it would have, co would have cost me $10,000. Um, so, so on that on that deal that you're talking about right there, did you already have the HELOC in place? You had access to it, or you went out and got it specifically for that opportunity? Because my question would be singular: which comes first? You know, if you're an investor, a potential investor watching the video right now, do you go out and you have that in the place so that you're ready to pull the trigger? Do you find the investment first, or do you find the money first? I guess is what I'm asking. I always want the resources ready if possible. Why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. you're trying to so you're not taking dollars. a deal and plugging it into the money. You've got the money available and then it's got it. Okay. Because listen, right now, especially we're seeing longer and longer delays in underwriting. What if it were to take 60 or even 90 days to get to the closing table? Even if everything else was perfect, you had all the equity in the world, you got perfect credit scores, you can show all your income. It's still going to end up taking a couple of months, possibly even three for you to get closed, which means that that deal might be long gone. That business partner couldn't afford to wait around for me. And if that deal was sitting around, what moron with the money wouldn't take it? <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, all, that's just a matter of having his investor deck appropriately presentable so he can go around and offer this to anyone that has $50,000. And if he did, he'd lock down that money by the weekend. So I had to move very, very quickly on that. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I did. It's been a tremendous win-win for everybody. My partner's thrilled, our staff is thrilled, we're bringing on new personnel. It's a really exciting time in that business right now. And we're, we're throwing even more money at it, including new debt weapons in the form of an auto loan. We have the ability to cash flow the, the access to this new vehicle that we just purchased a couple weeks ago. And yet we chose to lock in a seven and a quarter, not a great interest rate, on a, on a uh, commercial van uh, installment loan. And we did that because we wanna to continue to remain as cash rich as possible right now. Whereas in other times, even just a couple short years ago, it would make sense to potentially remain as debt free as possible. I've already said, I don't believe in debt. I think debt's the biggest threat, but if we can use this for an extra, I think the payment came in at $513 a month on this specific van, you know, $513 a month in order to have a second operation underway, and yes, we had to buy the equipment for that van as well. That came in at another like 30 or 40 grand in, in all in. Um, and that payment too will have to be factored. But if each operation is bringing in, we're bringing in about $1,000 each and every day of the week, seven days a week on just one operation. So if we're able to now double that, of course it would make sense to finance. And then we can still stockpile the capital on the sideline. So if in the event something were to come up, that debt could be paid off right away if necessary. Um, that, that would be my recommendation at the moment is to just hoard cash and get access to the liquidity. And again, that's really where accessing other people's money, OP, OPM, right? Now, while you can, when you don't need it, when you're still wondering and scratching your head what, what, what I may maybe use this for, I had absolutely no prediction that I would end up in the sewer business. None whatsoever. I mean, it just seems hilarious to me even today. After a year and a half of running that business now, it's still hilarious. So I, I, I just want that sort of uh, unpredictability and open-mindedness to stay 
totally probable for the people who are watching this video because I think that's where some of your best opportunities are going to happen is when you're being open-minded, when you're staying open-minded and, um, and, and you, you accept the fact that something might happen uh, <laughs> that you could have never predicted. There's obviously a lot of information to talk about when you're discussing the topic of debt weapons and how these tools can help serve you and where to be careful by using them and what the application processes look like. But continue to stay tuned into the channel. We're going to continue to have as much new content as possible as the times continue to change and how it relates to these extremely powerful tools and how they may be able to serve you, not just to survive this really difficult upcoming market crash, but to thrive during it as well. This could end up proving to be the one or the two tools that end up building you your largest amount of wealth so far. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing you on the next video. Michael, thank you for your time. We will check you guys on the next one. Until then, make it a great day and keep on cash flowing. Take care.